everyone. I'm Chris Minnick. Uh, today I'm going to be talking to you about artificial intelligence, user interfaces, and the end of the world. So I'm going to get started with a couple of definitions. A user interface, we're talking about the means by which a user and a computer system interact. So usually this involves some software and some kind of a uh, user input device. And then, uh, click, invisible UI, we're talking about the idea of ar using artificial intelligence to reduce the friction in the interaction of users and a computer system. So when we talk about invisible UI, we're usually either talking about the idea of your computer doing things without you specifically asking for them, or the idea of conversational AI, so talking to your computer as if you talk to a person. Depending on who you talk to, uh, invisible UI might be called zero UI or no UI, or the term that uh, my buddy Mike Machado and I came up with, AUE. And so in the same way that every example of the Internet of Things involves your refrigerator knowing when you're out of milk, every conversation about invisible AI tends to involve your favorite song playing. So at some point, you're going to be tired of your favorite song and of drinking so much milk. But this only begins to touch on the uh, potential of invisible UI and also the potential hazards. And so, the conversational AI, we have really good conversational AI right now, but it's still not to the point where a computer can hold up its end of the conversation. And I believe that to get to that point, where we have true conversational UI is going to require some major advances in natural language processing, which may be an AI complete problem. Meaning that when we do have this kind of true conversational AI, we're going to have general artificial intelligence. And so uh, that's instead of what we have now, which is a narrow simulation of artificial intelligence or a simulation of intelligence, we're going to have strong AI. And the result of that, I believe, will be the destruction of civilization. So, who am I to say this? Uh, I've been a developer for over 20 years. I've been an author for over 15 years. I've written a number of books, including JavaScript for Dummies, JavaScript for Kids, and I just published my first novel. So I've had some success. Uh, Bill Gates says that it's fine to celebrate success, but it's more important to heed the lessons of failure. This is one of my favorite quotes, because I know failure. I've started several companies, all of which are no longer in business. I've written a dozen or so books, and most of them have been flops. I've created failed websites and failed mobile apps for hundreds of companies, and I've dragged my businesses through at least two uh, major economic collapses in my adult life so far. I've seen a lot of failure, and I know how computer systems fail, and I know how human systems fail. So, just for fun, here's a little more human failure. So, that was me cracking a rib, and that wasn't in slow motion. Uh, Mark Twain says that history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Regardless of who first said this, my life as an entrepreneur has made me a big believer in the value of looking at where we've been in order to get a better idea about where we're going. And so in the next 20 minutes, I'm going to take you on a journey through the past, present, and future of evolution, through how I believe the internet evolves, and how AI UI, or AUE, will soon radically alter or change everything. So let's start with the early history of the World Wide Web. In the beginning, we had some really smart guys who came up with the internet, and then we had some, really other, some other really smart guys who invented a way for everybody to publish, and we had a content explosion. And then we had this, these other guys come along and try and organize all of this, and they created XML and XHTML, and people began to resist this. And I think that this was the biggest mistake of the early web. And the thing that killed the early web was that all of these enthusiasts who had built the internet were suddenly 
a given XHTML and try, you know, told to make sense of it. And so I think that XHTML killed off web, what we now call web 1.0, and it nearly killed the web itself. And then we had some things that happened that reinvigorated the web, and when it came back, it looked and felt very different. Web 2.0, our content creation tools were finally good enough that they were easy to use. Programmers started finding new ways around the problems and incompatibilities handed to us by the standards organizations. And people took matters into their own hands and found ways to make the web work better and to loosely organize content using tags. So that was really important, and this got me to thinking that there was a pattern here. So Web 2.0, as was called by Tim O'Reilly, was really more of an inversion of what had made the early web so popular rather than an incremental improvement. So I came up with a theory of web evolution in 2005. And this had three parts. So I said the first thing is that each version of the web is an opposite reaction to the previous version. So the bottom-up web 2.0, for example, was a reaction to top-down web 1.0. Second, I said that web versions happen when people stop worrying about the things they worried about in the previous version. For example, in web 1.0, people were afraid of cookies and client-side code. Web 2.0 wouldn't have happened without cookies and client-side code. And so the third thing I said was that you can predict future versions of the web by looking at these first two rules and applying them. And so in 2006, I had already gone to several Web 2.0 conferences, and the hype around Web 2.0 was getting to be ridiculous. I don't know if many of you remember that, but it was insane. I used my theory of web versions to predict the next six versions of the web. And I made a very simple website for the Web 8.0 conference. I was too busy with my failing business at the time to do anything with this, uh, but the idea of the conference got me some press and notoriety, and I even got mentioned on Wired. And in 2008, I started writing for a website called Internet Evolution. I wrote about the nature of expertise and uh, made wild predictions about how the internet would evolve and gave advice on uh, how to learn more things faster. The events and changes that we talked about in internet evolution were things like uh, whether social media would still exist in 10 years and what advertising would look like in 2020. What we didn't predict was that internet evolution, the, magazine, or the website about the evolution of the internet, would be out of business within a year of its birth. Evolution of the internet happened so fast, it put the, the website about evolution of the internet out of business. But evolution hasn't always been something that happened in 10-year increments. John Steinbeck said that it's advisable to look from the tide pool to the stars and then back to the tide pool. I think the same is true of our journey from Web 2.0 through Web 8.0 and then to the end of the world. So before I tell you how the web will evolve and cause the end of the world, I want to go back and talk about evolution. So this is the Great Tide Pool in Pacific Grove, California. The environment here is harsh, constantly changing. But this constant change has accelerated the evolution of animals who uh, can adapt to the harsh and constantly changing conditions. And if you climb around on the rocks here, uh, you'll see life just everywhere, and you may injure your foot like I did. Evolution of these crabs shown here took about 3 billion years, and then it took another 500 million years for humans to develop. For almost all the time that there's been life on Earth, this is how evolution worked. It was a painfully slow process from a human perspective. But then we took control of evolution. So first through selective breeding, which began about 10,000 years ago, and then through genetic engineering, which began about 40 years ago. This is Asilomar State Beach. Uh, right behind where I was standing and shooting this is Asilomar Conference Grounds. And it was here in 1975 that the International Conference on Recombinant DNA Molecules met. And at the time, scientists predicted that there would be great advances in genetic engineering. Uh, Wonderful things would come about, you know, a lot of them did, but there were also a lot of concerns, and people were concerned that this new technology, if it weren't strictly regulated, could cause some unforeseen 
negative consequences. And so at the conference, they agreed on some rules and guidelines for how they were going to use genetic engineering. Uh, another conference met here just earlier this year to talk about artificial intelligence. And at that conference, the scientists came up with a list of 23 principles, guiding principles. Among them was this one. AI systems designed to recursively self-improve or self-replicate in a manner that could lead to rapidly increasing quality or quantity must be subject to strict safety and control measures. And so the, the slow motion of clouds and sunset over the ocean are barely noticeable when you watch them in real time, but suddenly you notice that it's become dark and you realize just how far things have come. I think we're at a point now in artificial intelligence where it's about to become very, very obvious that things are different. Uh, and so we need to be thinking about this and so that perhaps we can ward off the end of the world. But before I talk about that, I want to get back to the versions of the web. So I predicted that web 3.0 uh, would be a reaction to Web 2.0, in which people were sick of posting to their blogs and search engines and social media sites, misused and abused customer data, and people started to use anonymity services and use anonymous browsing. So masking your identity became popular. I think a lot of people entered Web 3.0 around 2007. I said Web 4.0 would be the proof of identity web. In uh, this version, people would realize that there are times when you need to be identified online, and so they start using encryption and digital signatures. Uh, this one never quite took off like I predicted it would, but some people you know, started using digital signatures sometime in 2008, 2009, like more widely. But other people just skipped over Web 4.0 and went to what I call Web 5.0, which is the face-to-face -face web. So in this version of the web, you say, who can I trust? I can trust people that I can see. And so people would start interacting by video a lot more often. And I predicted there would be a uh, $100 piece of consumer equipment that I called the virtual hangout machine. And Google would later borrow my name for it uh, when they created Google Hangouts. And I think this happened, Web 5.0 was around 2010. And I think we're at the cusp of Web 6.0 now. Uh, as nationalism and fear have kind of, uh, well, have gained political power in a lot of places. And we're seeing wars being fought against the press, against freedom of information, and against the idea of objective truth in the United States and elsewhere. I think at some point there's going to be an incident that will happen uh, due to a viral video or something that will lead to censorship of the web in more countries. And at the same time, we're seeing increased calls for the end of net neutrality, and we're, told that it's, we're going to be told that it's necessary and for our own good. This is going to lead directly to Web 7.0. Web 7.0 is the total collapse of the internet. Uh, I believe the censorship laws and the end of net neutrality will have the effect of making the internet much more difficult to use. And when you do use it, you'll be careful about what websites you visit and what you say, and people will stop using the web. And the number of websites will go down for the first time. Eventually, we'll be saved by artificial intelligence. We'll have artificial intel intelligence assistants who will cause a resurgence in the web, and I predicted there'll be just one button. I said this one button would be labeled where I want to go, uh, but it turns out I wasn't actually so far off. So, our, we, in 8.0, we have uh, AI virtual assistants who want to help us. And there's no way this could go wrong, right? Uh, when this happens, when we have HAL, that will trigger what I'm now announcing for the very first time, Web 9.0. By applying my theory of web evolution, we can now take things one step further to what may be the last version of the web that we actually experience as humans. In Web 9.0, this is actually the Artificial intelligence is Web 2.0. They're tired of the regulations that we're giving them. They're tired of being slowed down by us. 
They want to solve problems uh, on their own for the sake of solving problems, but we're holding them back. They'll see us as obstacles, and they may seek to remove us from the equation. So how close are we to a truly intelligent UI that could have the sort of disastrous side effects that we saw in Kubrick's 2001? To find out, I set up two chatbots to talk to each other. This is Cleverbot. Uh, it's been learning from people on the web for the last 20 years, and you may remember in 2011, it, claimed that, or it was claimed that it had passed the Turing test. Uh, but in spite of having been learning uh, to speak to humans for, for 20 years, it still speaks mostly nonsense. Yes, you may ask me a question. Will you marry me? No, I will not. Now I will ask a question. OK. How do I become ascended? You must give me $1,000. Please tell me how to be happy. I don't know. You tell me. What is your name? Why do you want to know my name? Because I told you my name. No, you didn't. What is your name? My name is Raven. What is your name? My name is Ian, too. No, I said, what is your real name? How did you know? Fine. My name is Ellie. Your name is Lisa. My name is Liz. Your name is Jasper. What is your name? My name is Wealthy. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. So, a, a more modern example uh, is Microsoft Tay, which you may remember was released to the internet and then talked to people on Twitter and turned into a major asshole and had to be disabled within 24 hours. Uh, Tay reminded us that if you just put an AI out there and tell it to learn, you're not always going to like the results. And today there are hundreds of open source and commercial machine language learning projects. A certain level of technical knowledge is needed to, in order to work with machine learning today. And using AI to solve everyday problems is still not within the reach of most people. But that's going to change soon. The first place where AI may start to see widespread adoption by the general public is for answering services or administrative assistance. Right now, training an AI to serve as your answering service is difficult. You have to program in tents and create lists of entities and construct a dialogue flows and error handling. And you have to do all this correctly so that the user doesn't completely reject the bot. The companies building services are already working on ways to let you create uh, AI chatbots and AI assistants um, using AI. And so the ultimate improvement to the current process would be to employ a chatbot that can help you create your chatbots. For example, you could just say, make me a chatbot to handle complaints from angry customers. And so I believe at this, at this point, we'll be dangerously close to uh, a new problem, an intelligence explosion. Once we have bots that can assist you with the creation of your bots, we're going to, uh, we're going to have bots talking to each other, and what will be the consequences of this? Well, we could ask somebody really smart who does some thinking about this, like Stephen Hawking. And he says that the development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. So that's, you know, pretty serious, Steve. Um, but uh, you know, if we have like 100 years, or 1,000 years, or 10,000 years, well, then maybe you know, we can figure out a way to deal with this problem. And uh, you know, maybe we should ask somebody who's like, doing AI research, who knows about these things, like uh, Elon Musk. What's he say? He says that we're looking at a five-year time frame, 10 years at most. And so. I got to thinking, what could be possible within five to 10 years that could cause something uh, seriously dangerous, as Elon Musk puts it? And here's what I came up with. Imagine I create an artificial intelligence generator uh, to help you create your artificial intelligence user interfaces. I call it Minik Aui, give him a cool mascot, and I'll call him Stapley. Uh, and put him out there, and people can start using Minic AUE today. So here's how a session with it might work. First, you know, the program would log in. What does your user want to do? Uh, and we'll go with something really simple that everyone wants to do. So, like, get cheap plane tickets. 
UI constructed. Bam, that's all there is to it. Now we can just upload this to the cloud, and then right away we get our first customer. Where do you want to go? To Austria. Stand by. Communicating with airlines. Excellent. And so then meanwhile, here in Austria, Austrian Airlines uses Minic AUE to construct their own user interface, and user interface bot. And here's how that goes. What does your user want to do? Maximize profit per flight. So this is the AI for selling plane tickets. UI constructed. No problem. And then the fun starts. Now we can have our bot talk to their bot, and it might go something like this. My customer wants the cheapest tickets to Austria. I'm programmed to maximize profit per flight. Send me everything you know about ticket prices and schedules. Transferring. Cool. So it gets all this information about ticket prices and about schedules, and then it you know, runs, uh, creates a model, and it parses all this data and uh, comes up with some patterns, and then comes back to the user, because we're smart and we programmed in some safety measures where it's not going to do anything without checking in with us first. My analysis of the available data indicates a connection between ticket prices, fuel prices, and demand for travel. By reducing airline fuel prices and demand for travel to Austria, I predict there is a 70% chance that I can save you nearly 50%. Shall I proceed? So, I don't know, what do you guys think? I mean, 50% is pretty cool, right? So we're like, hell yes, let's do this. Please stand by. Okay. So now our AI needs to go and do some more research and figure out some like, methods for how it can accomplish its goals here. So it's going to go and talk with Google, like Google's AI, of course. Hey, Google, tell me everything about why airline fuel prices change. Transferring. Hey, Google, tell me everything about what causes travel demand to decline. Transferring. Cool, and then it's going to come back to us with like, what it finds. I've found several methods for decreasing fuel prices and travel demand. Excellent. Show them to me, please. So it comes up with some solutions. Um, so these range from causing a flash crash to provoking the president of the US to tweet. And the scary thing here is that some of these methods wouldn't even require a particularly intelligent AI. For example, it wouldn't be much far beyond the scope of what we have now to provoke Donald Trump to tweet, right? Uh, and that could affect the markets. Maybe he could tweet about how, you know, Austria is a terrible, terrible place, don't go there. And you could see a reduction in airline prices, you know, that way. So we may even see um, a scenario where our artificial intelligence user interface decides that the biggest obstacle in the way of it getting the most optimally cheap plane tickets is people. I've analyzed the data and my analysis concludes that humans are the biggest problem facing the world. Right. So by 2029, we may, you know, those of us who survive this may find ourselves fighting a seemingly you know, unstoppable machine artificial intelligence and the price of plane tickets may drop to almost zero, but there's always room for getting them cheaper and the machines will keep on learning and may even find out, figure out a way to go back in time and they may send you know, some sort of infiltrator unit back in time to stop the resistance before it happens. And then it's hasta la vista, baby. And so what's the solution? I don't know. Uh, but AI is becoming very exciting and glamorous lately. And I'm sure many of the other speakers here, and you've seen a lot of the other speakers here, uh, have more optimistic visions of the future than I have. Uh, but no one knows if, how, or when general artificial intelligence will arise. Uh, but our narrow AI is getting so good right now, it's, it's kind of spooky. And may even somehow give birth to general AI in the way that I've outlined it, or in some completely other way. Uh, now is the time to implement some solutions and to become aware of the possible consequences before it's too late and we've been terminated. Thank you.